Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Stories from Open Space, our weekly show where we bring together in Zoom experts on the history of the first wilderness with students who will drive 60 minute interviews that we will publish on Stories from Open Space. Our expert this week is Ellen Apperson Brown, the grandniece of famed wilderness preservationist John Apperson. Our student co host uh, is uh, Mae Bratton. She's a sophomore at Skidmore College who's dual majoring in English and music and exploring an interest in environmental journalism. We started this series last week with Warren County planner uh, Wayne Lamoth. Next Thursday, we'll have David Gibson, managing director of Adirondack Wild and direct heir to the career of the great Paul Schaefer, whose life and contributions will be a major focus in this series. And before uh, there was Paul Schaefer, there was John Apperson, our own John Muir, a crusader for wilderness preservation whose passion for the Adirondacks was absolutely unbridled. Ellen Apperson Brown knows his story very well, along with many other stories. Over the next hour, we'll learn as much as we can from her through a carefully framed series of questions. We're delighted this week to welcome May Bratton to the program. May is a sophomore at Skidmore with an interest in environmental journalism. I think we're giving her a crash course in the history of wilderness preservation in New York State, told by those with firsthand knowledge of it. If there are viewers who have questions, by the way, please submit them through chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can later on. So May, please begin the interview. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, this is such a wonderful opportunity and it's a pleasure to meet you, Ellen. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I, without further ado, I'll just run you through our nine questions. Um, the first of which is just um, who was John Apperson and how should we remember him? Great question. Thank you, May. It's nice to be here and to have a chance to talk about my favorite subject. <laughs> My great uncle John Apperson was born in a little town in Southwest Virginia and his mother died when he was nine and he just roamed around. And I think it's important to understand that he was most comfortable being outdoors, being on his own, exploring and finding friends to go around with him and keep him company. And he didn't do too well in school because he didn't want to sit still. He'd rather be out doing anything else. And by the time he was 17, his father had found him a job as a surveyor with the Marion and Rye Valley Railroad. And I think that's a really important <clears throat> aspect of his life. If you can imagine how a 17 year old would have mastered all of the engineering for surveying and all the management skills to have hundreds of men working under him when he was 17 and 18. So I think <laughs> that, that tells us a lot that he was a good manager, that he was well organized, that he was self-confidence, probably a little cocky. He was small of stature. One of Irving Langmuir's biographers said he was this giant. And I go, no, he wasn't, <laughs> uh, but he was really, uh, energized and uh, found a purpose in whatever he did. And he decided he wanted to uh, try going up to Schenectady where he heard there were jobs. He had to work in construction at first <laughs> and finally got into the test training program. His older brother Hall was there um, and he did exceedingly well. And he was willing to take mail order classes in, in mathematics and algebra to make sure he did well with all of the things he needed to do. And to put that in perspective, by 1915, he gave speeches at the Constitutional Convention in Albany and stood up for what he felt so strongly about. He felt it would not be appropriate for the state to lease campsites in the Adirondack Park or the Forest Preserve, because he knew darn well that meant that for-profit businesses would start owning parts of the forest and doing the wrong thing. So he won great acclaim and he saved the Forever Wild Clause in 1915. And by 1938, when it came up for a vote again, again, he was on the winning team and had marshaled 
you know, just a phenomenal uh, number of organizations in New York and beyond to be interested in and supportive of the cause. So that, that's what I think is important to know about him. Thanks. Yeah, um, so could you please tell us about your relationship with Apperson as well and um, your visits to the Huddle Bay? Sure. Well, I was born in Schenectady, uh, probably not too far from where Uncle John lived. Um, my dad worked for General Electric. Um, and of course we spent plenty of time at Lake George, but all I remember is being brave and going out into the little thing we call Tadpole Bay to go swimming. Uh, but we left Schenectady when I was about five, went to Erie, Pennsylvania, and then went down to Charlotte, North Carolina. And that meant that we still had lots of involvement with Uncle John and lots of concern about what was going to happen with the camps at Lake George but we could only go for a week or two in the summer. So my childhood memories are of these driving, driving in the car, spending the night with my aunt Ellen in Richmond and getting up to the lake. And it was magical to wake up in the upper story of the main camp and hear the water lapping and get to go out in the canoe and, you know, experience all that, learn how to prepare meals over a wood stove and learn how to wash the dishes so that you don't, uh, you know, get detergent in the, in the lake and yeah, all of those traditions. It was just so dear. But the other thing about it is that even when I was young, he was already getting up there and concerned about what would happen with his property at Lake George in the Huddle Bay and concerned about Dome Island. And we were concerned too. And poor, my poor father and his brother, Jim Apperson, you know, knew that there was this lifetime of stuff that Appy had started and was doing that would probably not keep going very well after he was gone. And so that's sad. And indeed, when Appy died in 1963, my father inherited it and really didn't know what to do. My uncle Jim bought some of it and, and then dad died in 1971 and uncle Jim died in 1980. And so by the time I was married and had young children by about 1987, we didn't have a place to come stay at Lake George anymore. we lost all of it. And yet I found a trunk of letters and photographs that had been passed on to me. And I opened it and realized, you know, this could be me, this could be my career now, is to find out what did Appy do? How did he do it? Who else did he know? And, and sure enough, I went on from there to get two more advanced degrees and one of them is in history. And fast forward to today, I'm still trying to write that huge biography, which nobody really wants to buy. And it's really hard to write. So I've made a website and I hope we'll get to mention that again some more. But now it's possible that this website can be like a digital archive and people can actually read all of these letters that I've transcribed. And uh, so I'm excited now that it's finally getting this platform today. And I can tell people and direct them to come find out what I've learned and ask Ellen. And I can tell you some more about these wonderful stories. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's really great to hear about how Apperson and Lake George have kind of been a um, continuity throughout your life, despite some obstacles. Um, but just to shift gears a little bit, um, the next question is um, about the Schenectady, for the Schenectady Force, if you could just talk about that, um, its major achievements, and Apperson's role in establishing it and developing it. Great. I never heard that term until I was reading a book by Frank Graham, uh, The Adirondack Park of Political History. And he referred to all of the political activity that was going on with activists, conservationists or environmentalists, call it what you will. They were all very active trying to fight different legal battles, different legislation that was being proposed. And so he called it the Schenectady Force. And he acknowledged that 
all that activity was pretty much passed along to Paul Schaefer, that Paul Schaefer discovered <laughs> Appy, got affiliated with him, and therefore uh, took part in and helped expand and grow. What it was is that Apperson started out by getting a lot of his friends around Schenectady to just go out on a, 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 you know, excursions and have adventures and try canoeing and try hiking and try skiing and water uh, skate sailing and everything possible. And eventually he got so interested in Lake George, it was so spectacular, nothing like that in Virginia, <laughs> that he and his buddies spent more and more of their time in at Lake George. And it became a whole group of people that felt sort of, they were part of this crowd, part of this affiliation. Uh, some people have given it a, a negative spin, like it was like a mafia, but I think it was just a group of good friends that wanted to do good things uh, to, to help save a uh, different property that was threatened, to help get out the word. And what they learned to do, even some of these friends of Appy's would leave General Electric and end up going to Chicago or California or another country, but they all got involved in clubs where they moved. So, and they all had ties that expanded. So this original nucleus of 20, 30, 40, 50 people, whatever it was, all stayed interested, were hooked on it, became ambassadors and helped spread it. I'd love to do a Venn diagram someday and trace where all, all these people went, a real diaspora of people. And what was really interesting about it is that Appy did not rely on the kind of nonprofit organization that has an executive director and a secretary and all the staff. Instead, uh, he was the CEO, unpaid, and he and his contacts could act instantly when a senator like Elwood Ravenel would tell him that they're planning to build the highway and this is what they're going to do, he could immediately contact other people that would need to know about it that could help fight it, whatever it was. So it was like a force. And I like to think of that term as being a little bit more uh, the Star Wars kind of use of the force. It was this, just this powerful thing that you couldn't quite quantify. And believe you me, his opponents were angry. <laughs> it, was, it was a terrible thing to confront because they couldn't just go storming into the office and talk to the executive director. It was, it was hard to, to pin down. Right. Um, and you're talking about some of um, Apperson's friendships. Um, so could you maybe elaborate on some of uh, his relationships, um, more specifically with Paul Vincent and Carl Schaefer? Definitely. Good question. Um, I would say that there are a number of people that I should mention before we talk about Paul, because Apperson did so much uh, in the teens that people haven't heard about. Uh, for one thing, there was an engineer named Robert Dougherty who helped him uh, do a map of the islands at Lake George and helped him survey it and helped him clean it up. And he wrote a poem to Appy in 1918 saying that he ought to be part of King Arthur's round table, that he's such a wonderful man. And uh, Robert just went on to be the president of Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> and, and then there's of course Irving Langmuir who uh, went on to win a new, uh, Nobel prize in chemistry uh, who happened to be just extremely excited to go hiking on skis in the high peaks. <laughs> and nobody had ever been doing that before. So they, they enjoyed the out of doors together, but they also had a lot in common with how to you know, address all of these political problems that they were confronted with. And frequently Irving knew how to get in touch with the right lawyer or knew how to find some money to pay for a lawyer to do whatever they needed to do. And uh, so there were wealthy friends who also were part of it. I mentioned Elwood Ravenold. He's mentioned in the big biography of Robert Moses. And apparently Elwood got on the wrong side of <laughs> Moses and a few others, and they managed to kill his job as a senator 
but he stayed active and was a real ally of Afferson and was in touch with everything going on in Albany and that was important. Apperson also made sure to learn about the law. And so he went as early as 1913 to Albany. He was sent as a delegate by the Schenectady County Conservation Council. And he listened to Lewis Marshall, for heaven's sakes, who really was the top civil rights attorney in the country. And Lewis uh, helped write the Forever Wild Clause, despite what different experts say. And of course, Lewis was the father of Bob and George Marshall. And by 1922, when Appy was a, um, what do you call it? Uh, one of the key opening members of the Adirondack Mountain Club, uh, he and his good friend Warwick Carpenter, who was the secretary of the Conservation Commission, made a big proposal asking um, for there to be uh, no more tree cutting on the high peaks. And they wanted this new club to take a stand on it. And so that's pretty fascinating. That's a friend that he made in the State Department, you know, who was the secretary, who then got fired, of course, because it was politically unpopular. But uh, Appy mentions Bob Marshall at his, when he had to give his speech there and plugged Bob Marshall's book. So all these people that you've heard about that were active, say by 1931 or two, probably had already met Appy at one of these clubs, in one of the talks, one of the pamphlets he'd gotten out. It, it, was, it was just a, a whirlwind of activity, but he met everybody. And he was a good judge of character and could tell you know, which people he could rely on. That's a, yeah. a summary of some of his friends. <laughs> um, so you kind of already touched on the next question, on the next question, um, but I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about Irving Langmuir, um, the Nobel Prize winner who kind of was always in the know about who to um, like get in touch with in the town and his role in the movement. Great, um, and I didn't mean to shortchange Paul Schaefer. I'll, I'll mention him too. Well, Irving Langmuir had skied in the Alps and had lived, had gotten his doctoral degree in Germany. And um, there were a lot of uh, German and Scandinavians working at GE. So there was a lot of people that loved all of the sports that, that were unique. Skiing was not really popular until they got it initiated. Um, but Irving uh, ended up trying to buy a camp in Saranac Lake in 1923 or four, I think. And Apperson invited, asked his, his friend, William Bixby, the millionaire, uh, if he knew of any place where Irving could buy some property at Lake George. And they worked it out because Appy really wanted Langmuir to have land there and to be a part of the Lake George community. So for a while, Apperson and Langmuir had some land um, in Huddle Bay and were neighbors. And that's where Vince Schaefer would often come because he worked for Langmuir in the lab, even though he didn't have you know, advanced degrees, he was a genius and, and Langmuir recognized that. And other neighbors at Lake George were Dorothea, I mean, sorry, Catherine Blodgett and uh, Edith Clark, who were top women scientists at GE. And Langmuir brought them in to have property there uh, near Appy in Huddle Bay. So Langmuir helped connect him. He had cousins that were in the Appalachian Mountain Club. So they would join on the Appalachian <laughs> Club for their um, hikes and excursions. And the list just grew and grew of connections. They also all belonged to the Association for the Protection of the Adirondacks. And that was a key group. And every time there was a political battle, you had to work with the leadership and try to persuade him. But every time things went wrong for Appy at GE, Langmuir was in a position to exert some pressure and say, look guys, you know, we can't do it without John Apperson. We've got to let him continue to work here. So he came to Appy's defense several times. 
And later on, when he wanted to buy Dome Island, because he saw that there were uh, markers on the trees that they're going to start building a hotel there, um, Appy uh, had to turn to, to Irving and sure enough, get about half of the, the money in a loan. And then they were able to buy it and he paid Langmuir back. Um, Paul Schaefer, just so I don't neglect him, uh, discovered Appy during the, the battles that were going on in 1930 and 31. And there's two important ones that I, I think people need to learn about. One was the Hewitt reforestation uh, amendment and Appy called it the tree cutting amendment. So you can kind of get the drift. They wanted to plant trees, doesn't that sound good? But he knew darn well that they wanted to have the rights to the land so that they could then cut the trees. And the other one was called the closed cabin amendment. And um, that was one where they, they thought it was just wonderful to build facilities throughout the Adirondacks for the convenience of all the tourists. But that would mean cutting lots of trees and totally open the door to just about any kind of construction of roads and of more uh, hotels and, and um, golf courses for that matter. Uh, so those were the things going on. And Paul Schaefer was in that battle because he was involved with the Adirondack Mountain Club. He was starting his own hiking club because he was so angry with the, the leadership at the Adirondack Mountain Club at the time. And that's when he got introduced to Happy, came by finally. They wrote several letters before Paul came by. And, and Paul describes it in his book. You can read it. Uh, but he was just amazed with all the things Happy was doing just in his home and all the projects he had underway and realized that this is going to be a connection that would be important for him. And he wanted to help. And so Appy was able to give an assignment to Paul, including one which had him go and take pictures in the high peaks. And that's when he happened to run into Bob Marshall. And it's kind of neat, all these people connected. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so while you're talking about things such as um, the tree cutting amendment, um, it's interesting to notice that although this story is set in Lake George, it also gives us um, the most vivid demonstration of Apperson's passion in protecting the forest. So could you talk a little bit about um, that broader um, passion of his? Great. Well, I think that he learned uh, in 1913, 14, 15, uh, about exactly what it was that the Forever Wild Clause was designed to do. It's a tool that no other state has, that the United States has never had, where if you don't like the law, you have to have two consecutive sessions and let everybody vote on a proposed amendment. You can't just rewrite the law in a given legislative session. You have to put it by the, uh, the test of whether it, it, it meets the standards of the law. So Appy understood that forever wild, that you're not supposed to cut the trees or destroy the trees, which can include flooding them <laughs> on islands, that, that that was just an amazing thing to hold up and to fight for. And that was the guiding purpose in his life, was to figure out which laws that were being promoted were actually an, a, a wicked backdoor effort to do something sneaky and break down the, the barriers of this law. So he was on it every time something was proposed that was hurtful. Now he's associated with Lake George and that's a natural outgrowth or a natural kind of theater for his operations. He couldn't spend all of his weekends and holidays at some camp in the middle of the Adirondacks. Instead, he was spending his time at Lake George once he had, uh, first he had an island to camp on and he was busy uh, saving it, fixing the shores by rip wrapping. 
But then he had a place in Huddle Bay and he worked from there and he identified uh, threats to Lake George, which included the forest preserve there. One of the threats was from the International Paper Company because they were raising and lowering the water without any regard to the erosion and the damage that was being done to the islands and to the shorelines. That was illegal. And he went uh, after that in a serious way. And with Langmuir's help, they had a uh, chance to be part of a lawsuit that went on for 15 years against the International Paper Company to try to do something about the water levels. But they also uh, were concerned about who owned the land. And by 1923, Appy was in an all out effort to create a Lake George Park. And the first big chapter of that effort would be to make sure that Tongue Mountain didn't get developed. It had already been logged and it was barren in much of the landscape, but at least there weren't roads going on to properties on Tongue Mountain and people wanted to put roads on Tongue Mountain. So that led into his first big confrontation with Robert Moses and Robert Moses was just getting started in his role. <clears throat> so the effort to keep Tongue Mountain as state property meant that you had to convince the landowners and some of them were the big logging interests, Coolidge and people like that. You had to convince them to donate or sell their land to the state. And Appy was able to get $75,000. And Moses said later that he did exactly what he wanted to with, with it. But part of the process was to get to know each of the wealthy families, William K. Bixby, Mary Loins and her daughters, and um, George Foster Peabody, who had land there. And then there were some harder nuts to crack with the Knapp family. George Knapp had the land on the Eastern side. And there was the Beckers, which was not a name he had any, any good luck fighting, but uh, he tried to make friends with them all and tried to figure out if he wasn't the good contact, who else could be the good contact? So all of these efforts were pre precisely about keeping the land undeveloped, wild. And today, the Lake George Land Conservancy has essentially completed everything Appy tried to do and they worked as partners so that all of those, the wing pond and all the places that were mentioned in the video the other day about um, places to go near Lake George, those preserves are all part of this original plan to keep the state from building roads through it and to keep, uh, I know initially Appy heard somebody wanted to put up a, um, a gas station on, on Tongue Mountain on a piece of land that they thought they had secured and they had to really you know, go, to, go to work to try to prevent that. But it took a lot of, lot of hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so going back to when you were talking about um, the Adirondack Park, could you talk a little bit more about um, John Apperson's major role in the expansion of the Adirondack Park? Wonderful. I, I don't think all of the details have been gathered yet. Um, several historians have tried to figure it out and I have a pretty good theory, but I'm not sure I've got it all pinned down. One thing that happened is that Appy knew Franklin Delano Roosevelt really well. He knew Al Smith. He knew about their political struggles with each other. He knew about uh, FDR wanting to be governor of New York and want to continue to get their votes go you later go on run and be president. But uh, in order to get the popular vote, Moses, I mean, sorry, FDR understood 
that he had to convince everybody that he was in favor of recreation and that he was not going to put the brakes on this um, amendment that I called the closed cabin amendment. If he was putting the brakes on that, it would make it look like he um, didn't care about recreation and didn't care that everybody should have access to the forests. And so the legislation that was coming up in Albany was difficult for FDR to deal with. And Appy understood that. So he made sure that he told FDR and Bill Moskowitz and everybody else that he was in touch with, he told them what really was going on, what was the ulterior motive, what's another you know, uh, approach to this that we could take, back and forth and back and forth. And I think the, the, uh, the people on the other side of the fence uh, started talking about moving the blue line to include Lake George. And Appy at first was really skeptical. It sounded like uh, another one of those efforts that could really have an ulterior motive behind it. And I can't begin to explain it all now. I have to think about it hard to explain it at all. But in the long run, it just so happened that FDR in 1931 was able to do it by executive stroke and say, we're gonna take the blue line and expand it to include Lake George. And essentially it meant, as far as Appy could do his work behind the scenes, that the property, of course the state islands, the islands and the narrows were already state land, but this made it possible for the state to buy lots more land on both sides and Tongue Mountain and Black Mountain Point all over and have it be part of the forest preserve and make sure that Lake George was connected to Warren County. If you think about it, when Appy started work, you couldn't drive from Bolton to the Hague or the Hog or whatever <laughs> the correct pronunciation is. You had to go way around, right? And he wanted to prevent that because he wanted there to be a hiking trail that would, you could start at Tongue Mountain and go west. And I don't know all of the ins and outs of everything in Warren County, that's not my bailiwick. But Appy saw it as all one whole. And I think at the very outset when he got to Schenectady, he probably thought, isn't that weird? Why do they have an Adirondack Park and not have Lake George, the most beautiful lake in the world? Why isn't that part of the park? Why aren't we trying to protect the park? Uh, that the lake as part of the park. And um, I think he's right. And yet it was already difficult. He found out from one of the top officials at the DNH um, riverboat company <laughs> that in, I think, 1910, they had 150,000 people on their boats traveling up and down Lake George in one year. So this was hardly a pristine wilderness but it had parts of it that could be protected. And it's now possible if you're, if you're at Dome Island or if you're at Crown Island where Langmuir's family lives, you can look north and virtually not see buildings and very few commercial developments at all for that midsection of Lake George. And now because of the Lake George Land Conservancy and the Loins family, you've got hiking trails all over that east, that western side of the lake. So that's as good a short synopsis as I can give you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, and this also goes back to something that you touched on in a previous um, answer, but um, going back to Robert Moses's plan to build a road around the edge of Tongue Mountain um, and how Apperson defeated that effort and pushed back against it. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how he did this? It's a really good story. <laughs> and everybody tells it. So the details are harder to pin down because there's so many versions. But um, 
Elwood Ravenold and John Apperson were already getting uh, law in front of the legislature by 1923 in the spring saying that um, there should be a Lake George Park and that the first uh, objective would be to um, try to get Tongue Mountain under, under state ownership as part of this park. And just when the news hit the fan, people in Lake George that uh, maybe they were the wealthy people that lived in Brooklyn or somewhere else, but they had summer land, they had summer property. They were really upset. The logging firms were really upset. All of the people that assumed they could do business, <laughs> develop stuff, more hotels, whatever, they saw this as outrageous that Tongue Mountain should be private, should be uh, sold and made state property with nothing built on it. So right at that time, when all of this energy and concern and anxiety was being stirred up, Apperson managed to invite Robert Moses and several other um, dignitaries, Ravenel, to come stay at his camp in, in Huddle Bay in advance of a big meeting, a big political meeting where everybody, the Lake George Association, um, all of the, the people from Albany that were involved in this legislation should come see what they're, what's being talked about. And Apperson had the idea that it made sense to try to organize a trip in a boat on the lake. And so he got his friend, William K. Bixby, who was a big philanthropist from, um, St. Louis, William let him have the use of the boat and they took 10 or 12 people out for a wonderful ride on a pretty day in July, I think it was, or maybe August. And they enjoyed the scenery, it was perfectly innocuous, but once they got close to Tongue Mountain, Appy pointed over to the steep slopes and gave his little spiel about can you imagine that they're trying to build a parkway on the steep slope here, right next to the water where you, it, it's gonna cost you. And he had all these figures on his sleeve and he was an engineer. So he knew something about what he was talking about. And, and Al Smith realized, well, that's, that's silly. Why, why would you put a parkway there? At that, at that, it, no, at, yeah, but no. And Robert Moses apparently, stepped up and said, oh, it's okay, it's okay. We have another plan B. We, we, we know of a good place to, we're gonna put it. And what's interesting um, is that the uh, Lowen's family made an announcement that same week, sent a letter to Albany offering to give 15 acres on Tongue Mountain, the only land they own is, and it's on Northwest Bay um, to the state but she made some very strenuous uh, stipulations that had to be a certain way. And it was just not build a road across the, uh, the creek, not for half a mile up, and to not do anything to disturb the wildlife and so forth. Well, Moses wrote back and said, well, thank you for your gift. I'll get the commissioner to talk with you. We'll need to fill out the forms and that's wonderful. And no, oh, we don't need to worry about any of the things that you said. No, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, the governor and all, we all agree on where it ought to go. and It'll be fine. <laughs> and I guarantee you, it's certainly at that point, Appy and Mrs. Loins and her daughter, Hilda, were well aware of the kind of person that Moses was. And yet I don't think everybody in the state figured that out initially, but he seized power with the Council on State Parks. Appy was a member, George Foster Peabody was, Ethel Dreyer was, a lot of the right people, all the old park patriots were on this committee, but Moses was very devious and underhanded, and he managed to use that as a source of power. So that for the next, uh, 10 years there at Lake George, Appy was totally frustrated with the activities 
that the state was doing. They weren't doing this right. They weren't doing that right. They were letting Jay Taylor's son cut trees on the islands and it's state property. And they were letting people build two story boathouses. And so Moses could have cared less. He didn't do anything to teach his, his staff, uh, you know, the land conservation people, uh, what was the appropriate thing to do. And he was indeed the villain behind the scenes. And they, Apperson and, and, and Moses kept in this sort of businessman polite back and forth and never had an all out angry word, but I guarantee you they both knew who their opponent was. So that, that's kind of the gist of it. It was an ongoing war between Appy and Moses and Appy was trying to take on the whole uh, department of what we call the DEC today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and the final question for this um, prepared conversation is um, just going back to Paul Schaefer, who you already um, mentioned earlier. Um, can we just talk about um, Paul Schaefer and John Apperson's um, different views for, um, or different views in terms of the discussion about the best route for the North Way um, right. and how those differences panned out? Okay. Well, it's a topic that I don't know a whole lot about and I would encourage everybody to ask uh, David Gibson in your next interview because he is really uh, an expert on what was happening with Paul Schaefer in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and whatever. Um, but from my perspective, uh, I've concentrated on learning more about what Apperson did in 1910 and 20 and 30 and up to what happened in the 40s with the big trespass case, the ongoing litigation where he had to get pictures and give evidence. So that by the 40s, Apperson and Schaefer, although they had uh, worked together on every policy, every, uh, you know, pamphlet, you know, Appy would send a copy to Paul and Paul would give it his two cents worth and make a few suggestions and maybe find an organization to get it published and do, you know, they, they collaborated every step of the way, but Schaefer was always like a, a student of Appy's, like the next generation uh, to whom Appy could say, oh, take this <laughs> and run with it. I know you do a good job. And meanwhile, Appy was still at the, the center of everything, calling the shots, trying to do things. But Appy had to move physically and mentally more and more to Lake George. By World War II, many of his uh, younger assistants and loyal team had been called up into uh, war service and uh, the, the duties at, at um, GE were uh, extra, you know, they worked extra long hours. He had to get uh, special permission for extra gas rations, you know, just to be able to get enough gasoline to drive not only to Lake George, but to one of the places in the Northern end to, to get pictures and uh, be a state's witness. So that was really consuming for John Apperson. And meanwhile, Paul was still out hiking with his buddies, building this network, uh, you know, the different hiking clubs, which you all probably know much better than I do. And uh, all this time, Apperson was still on the conservation committee of the Adirondack Mountain Club. But you know, by the time he was 65, he wasn't <laughs> organizing the hikes throughout Western Warren County. <laughs> so the natural aging of John Apperson, the progression of things led to a point where he and Paul still corresponded. We have wonderful letter in 45, 1945, where um, Paul complimented John for a talk he gave, I think at the Adirondack Mountain Club and beautiful letter he wrote. And you're better than you were 15 years ago when I first met you and 
just is just wonderful. And Apperson wrote a very effusive response, and and they were they were really close and very warm. But Apperson had his own organizations. One was called the Forest Preserve Association, and Langmuir was a big part of that. And they were fighting all this legislation. But Paul wasn't really central to Appy's group. And Paul started his own, I think, Friends of the Forest Preserve. And that began to be a sort of wedge between them. And like I say, David Gibson can give you more detail. But at some point before Appy died, probably by about 1957, he was aware that his ability to control how things turned out in this political fight over where to, the North Way should be constructed, Appy began to realize that he was not winning. He was not getting his point of view across to everybody. And I think he realized that Paul Schaefer was having more influence. I think they had, I think Apperson was pretty sure he disagreed with Paul Schaefer. That's as close to a blow up as I can give you. I don't think there was anything really ugly that happened, but it's kind of sad that Appy has a protege and he hands him this project and lots of projects and then has to realize, doggone it, I wish you wouldn't do it that way. And that's the way I sense it. And Dave Gibson is fully aware of this because after Appy died, his organization, the Forest Preserve Association, kind of, you know, like floundered. The Lake George Protective Association went on for a few years and it kind of floundered. And the Dome Island Committee, fortunately, kept going because of um, Art Newkirk and Phil Hamm, who did an amazing job of keeping all of these initiatives going that Apperson had started. But clearly, by the time uh, Paul Schaefer started to set up the Adirondack Research Library. He's regarded as his own entity, his own, you know, reputation for his scholarship and all of his writing and his library. And John Apperson and his friends had worked for 10 years uh, organizing all of Appy's papers. And believe me, it's a lot. I went home with four crates back in 1998. Uh, the Kelly Center says they have about 80 uh, cubic feet of Apperson's papers. But um, so the Apperson and Schaefer libraries did finally combine. They did finally morph, morph sorry, into the Kelly Adirondack Center. And there's still an Adirondack Research Library, but it's a little bit confusing now that you've got Protect the Adirondacks, which officially owns all that. And there's still uh, Paul, um, you know, Dave Gibson's group, Adirondack Wild, Friends of the Forest Preserve. So it's confusing. It's a very complicated story. But Appy would have been, you know, full of praise for Schaefer all of his life, but he would have been grinding his teeth at some of the things his favorite student was doing. And by the way, in 1996, probably two months before Paul died. I was in Schenectady, in Niskayuna, on Roland Drive at the ARL for an unveiling of the Apperson Room. And Paul Schaefer gave me a wonderful green uh, cup. <laughs> uh, and uh, may, Paul made a wonderful speech about how he owed everything to John Apperson. So there's not bad blood between them, but I think it's only inevitable that if you're trying to keep control of myriad different initiatives and groups of people and individuals that Appy got tired and wasn't able to keep it up through the end of his life. Right, absolutely. Um, so that was my last question. I'm going to turn it back to Dan, but thank you so much for being here thank with you. us. Thank you, I enjoyed having your, your help with this big project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting, uh, Ellen. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. If anyone has any questions that they'd like to put into chat, we'll certainly uh, pose them to Ellen. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about um, 
Uh, John Apperson's role at GE. What did he do at GE? How did he have all this time to do, you know, to go up to, uh, you know, Lake George and to fight these battles? Um, and can you tell us also about the incident where he was actually uh, fired at one point because of his environmental activities and, and how his job yeah. was saved? Right. Well, um, he became an engineer officially in 1904 and was one of the team leaders there in the power and mining commercial department, uh, power and mining, whatever it's called. Uh, and he had three or four engineers working under him even as early as 1904 or five. And uh, they handled uh, complaints, they handled contracts, they handled, uh, um, what do you call it when you have an idea for a new, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment. At any rate, they, they had a lot of responsibility and they were busy, busy, busy. The senior officer in power and mining was a guy named David Rushmore. And David liked Appy. He went to Lake George with him and there's pictures of him enjoying the camping and the different projects. Um, they corresponded, they had a wonderful rapport. And in 1922, there are letters uh, that indicate that Rushmore and Apperson were well aware that things were being reorganized at GE. And uh, they were concerned because one of the other executives wanted to take these five engineers and reassign them. And that would have done a lot of damage to the plans that they had in their department. So there was conflict and trouble was brewing. So it wasn't totally a surprise when Apperson got called in, uh, I think the name was Rice to the, to the top executive's office and with little preamble told him that that he wasn't needed anymore, that he could look for other work in, in the company, but they didn't need him in power and mining anymore. And Apperson described everything in detail. It's on my website. <laughs> you can enjoy reading exactly what correspondence went on between him and his immediate boss, David Rushmore. And of course, the big question is, how did this hit him out of the middle of nowhere? Uh, without any evidence and a, just a general feeling you got from the boss that there's been, he's been told that Apperson did horrible things and said horrible things about GE. And you went, what? Um, and Rushmore was being uh, promoted to, the, to be a consultant engineer, which is really not a promotion. So the whole management was broken up and I have a, a painting here in my house that was given to John Apperson at a special ceremony in 1922. And it's a painting of his, the front of his camp there at Lake George in Huddle Bay. And everybody's, you know, signed on with how much they appreciate his wonderful leadership. So about six months later, he'd already gotten some ideas about who his enemies were and who had gone to the, the higher ups and made sure that he got fired. And um, nevertheless, he was able to be uh, introduced to a new position in what they called engineering general. So he was handling again, all the contracts, all the minutia, all the management, all the details and keeping up with everything. It was a big job. He also had a chance to be in management in the way of PR. He was involved with getting the faculty, the engineering faculty at Virginia Tech, VPI, down in Blacksburg to come up for three weeks to study engineering at GE and to spend a lot of time at Lake George. Now that's the kind of thing that he could do in an upper level management job, you know, had great PR ideas and was able to follow through. And we've got photographs of that that I can't wait to publish. Um, so that was all good. But we now have heard, and I've read carefully all the correspondence that I have access to, that Irving Langmuir let John know in a letter and said, please don't share this with anyone. 
But every time they tried to get uh, in on good terms with George Knapp, who owned all of this property on the eastern shore of Lake George, um, that George was in favor of preservation. He was in favor of preserving it. But his son, William, was trying to buy that land from his father. He was working with Beckers, who was a notorious <laughs> millionaire on the Villa Maria Antoinette. Um, they, were, they were definitely interested in developing Paradise Bay commercially and in doing logging on this big land. So whether it was William that started the ball rolling or whether there was someone else whose name was Cole, C-O-L-E, that's all I know because I only used his last name, who complained to George and worried poor George to death and said, John Apperson is not who you think, he's a bad guy. You've got to get rid of him. He's he's going to ruin us. It's just awful. You should hear what. And so there was all this propaganda. And so George changed his mind. And William may have been the one to actually contact whoever his best contact was at GE. All these people that had a lot of money would have been, you know, on the board and had financial dealings with GE as a big up and coming money making proposition. So. Appy's activities on behalf of Forever Wild put a target on his back for a lot of the people that had a lot of money and influence. And as far as him having time, I think the critical thing was is that he realized he didn't want to get married. If he had married Sylvia Loins, which was a possibility, just imagine how he'd have to fit in with her travel, her house in Brooklyn, her, <laughs> you know, I can't imagine Appy, you know, just being uh, involved with a traditional marriage like that. Instead, he found uh, a wonderful neighbor, Mrs. Christie, who loved to fix him meals when he was at the lake. And he was kind of footloose and foot free, if, uh, and free about it. So he, he did by the rules, he worked by the book, by the clock. I'm sure he did his duty as an upper level management person and he did it well. And uh, also on my website, there's a wonderful uh, artistic drawing of Lake George that his, um, all the people in engineering general uh, put together that teased him about all of his activities at Lake George. And um, everybody knew it, everybody loved him, and it was not an issue. But around Lake George, if you read Great and Gracious, the millionaires um, on Millionaires Row there at Lake George, Catherine Graham <laughs> talks about those scientists, you know, they swim in the nude. And you know, they have something about moving the lake, the the the, the dam, you know, like Langmuir and you know Apperson, you know, Doctor Apperson. She called him Doctor Apperson, you know. But the the what people know at Lake George is fairly apocryphal, and was brought out by this fifteen year lawsuit called the Water Trespass Case that um, had. Lots of prominent people just furious at John Apperson and Irving Langmuir. Well, thanks very much. We've come to the end of the hour. It's certainly a fascinating Long story. Answer. There's, a, there's a lot more to it. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll have you back for a, another conversation. Great. And we'll see you in base camp, too, and continue to work the story together there. And uh, at this point, uh, May is going to get a transcript uh, of this produced by Trent, an AI tool that will give her a very clean transcript. She'll do an edit on it and we'll post that when it's finished in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, this will be posted on YouTube as a, as a resource that anyone can, can look at. So uh, until next week, we will have David Gibson um, at two o'clock on Thursday and we'll pursue some of these questions, Ellen, uh, about the Northway and others. And uh, with that said, uh, I think we'll sign off and look forward to seeing people next week. So again, you, Ellen. Right. thank you so much. Ellen, thanks thank so, much. so much. This is great. Great show. So long.